I've had my ups and my downs. I think it's an absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show. The show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, let's go. Listeners, welcome to another episode of the Physical Performance Show. I trust you've been having a great week and I trust that you've been enjoying pursuing your physical best. On today's episode, I share a very special conversation with you that I had recently with OAM, Order of Australia Medal recipient Curtis McGrath. Curtis McGrath has been described as perhaps Australia's most inspiring world champion athlete. Curtis's accolades are long and very extensive. Curtis is a six times world para canoe champion. Curtis is the 2016 Rio Paralympic champion in the KL200 event in the para canoe. In addition, Curtis took out two world championship gold medals in the KL Men 200 and the VL2 Men 200 in the world. International Canoe Federation Sprint Champs in 2017. Curtis also took out two World Championships medals in 2016 and, of course, the Paralympic gold. Curtis is also an Invictus Games ambassador, but perhaps above all achievements, it's how Curtis has gone about these coveted achievements that has made him such a revered figure in the world of sport and such an inspirational figure for so many. Curtis was serving as a combat engineer in Afghanistan in 2012 when at the tender age of just 24 years, Curtis tragically lost both of his legs after stepping on a homemade improvised explosive device. Just 30 minutes after losing both of his legs in this horrific blast, in those traumatic moments, Curtis was being stretched from the bomb site, and yet Curtis was already thinking about pursuing a career as an amputee athlete. In today's episode, we talk about that moment following the blast, what was going through Curtis's head, how he helped his mates look after him in that traumatic moment. We talk about the highs, the lows, and the learnings of Curtis's career to date. We talk about growing up in New Zealand, finding his athletic way as a teenager, entering the Defence Force, humanitarian work in Timor, the deployment to Afghanistan, the incident, and then finding his way into the paracanoe world after the incident. We talk about the frustration and disappointment when Curtis, who made his way initially into the outrigger canoe, was forced to begin training in the lead up to the Rio Paralympic Games when the International Paralympic Committee made the decision to replace the outrigger canoe with a sprint kayak. Curtis had to quickly adapt to the kayak to become eligible for the Paralympics. We speak about that moment, how he handled that, navigated it, and obviously came out on top. We talk about Curtis's training philosophies, his training schedule, what it's like living with both legs being amputated, the challenges that that presents. Curtis shares very openly and transparently. So listeners, I know you're going to take a whole lot out of this episode. One of the missions of the Physical Performance Show is to inspire our pursuit of our physical best. And I know that as you delve into the story of Curtis McGrath, OAM, you you are going to certainly be moved and also inspired to pursue your best. So let's jump in with Curtis McGrath, OAM. Listeners, this is an absolute treat. Uh, really, today's guest, Curtis McGrath, is a dream guest. Uh, obviously, Curtis's profile has sprung to prominence in recent times, particularly off the back of his Paralympic gold in Rio uh, and the amazing story that accompanies Curtis's 
you know, what seems like a, a quick rise to uh, Olympic gold. However, there's so much more behind the scenes. So Curtis McGrath, you're joining us here at at the recording in the practice today. Welcome to the show. Good morning. How are you going? Very well, Curtis. Let's start with something a little bit fun. What's one thing that scares Curtis McGrath? Um, hmm. Scares me. I suppose the, uh, the sharks in the lake are pretty, pretty prominent this time of year, so they can be a little bit uh, of, a, of a challenge uh, just to push through, but... Um, most of the time they keep to themselves so. and so to put listeners in perspective i mean you do a lot of your training here on the gold coast yeah. uh, i believe at a lake or mm-hmm. with your coach andrea king and so it is a well-known bull shark hot spot right yeah that's right we see it a couple um as the water heats up they get a little bit more active and uh there's actually a resident stingray down the end and he's uh made an appearance on the back of someone's boat before and yeah so they, they jump out at you and not at you but around you and i think they're just chasing fish but you never know when one's going to pop out because you can't really see very deep in that lake and it is a deep lake with a lot of life in it. Uh, funnily enough, I remember doing a junior triathlon there in 1993, the <laughs> yeah, BP right. Junior Triathlon Series at Bond University. So yeah, well, I don't know if the bull sharks would have made it in there <laughs> by then. I'm still here. <laughs> Curtis, uh, in terms of your journey, I mean, uh, the world, and particularly Australians, uh, really just resonated with your story um, when you took that Paralympic gold in Rio de Janeiro uh, in 2016 and the bit that obviously grabbed Australians hearts and minds was your story of the adversity that you'd overcome to uh, achieve that incredible achievement so can we before we go through the military part of the story and obviously you know the loss of you know, your legs in the accident mm. in Afghanistan can we reverse and go right back to growing up I believe it was Queenstown New Zealand what yep. was life like for you mate growing up brothers sisters sports what was the world like for you yeah I um I'm one of three children I'm the oldest um my younger brother um he's 25 uh, and I got a little sister who's 19 um and I had a very active lifestyle growing up. Obviously, Queenstown's quite a, an adventurous sort of place with a lot of opportunities for a kid to get outdoors. And, and um, even the school's curriculum is based a lot around um, outdoor activity and um, making use of the, the outdoor facilities that they've got there, all the natural ones. So, you know, in the winter, I'd go snowboarding and play rugby, and in the summer, I'd play cricket and go kayaking or and whatever else, mm-hmm. swimming and... Yeah, so there's a, a lot on offer in Queenstown and um, and the event of that is me not doing too much school, especially in the winter. Um, <laughs> I think in my last year of school I had a bit of a, few, a fair few absent absent days um, just because the you know the snow's good and we got the means with driver license and everything like that to get up the the mountain and and uh, go for a snowboard. But um, you know it it was. It was a great place to grow up, but as I um, came to the end of school, I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do, but a lot of my friends were heading off to university, and you know, as I had an active lifestyle, I didn't really want to commit to more study and, and teaching and, and whatnot, so I made the decision to try. I did a work experience thing with the New Zealand Army um, in Burnham, um, just outside of Christchurch and, and I really enjoyed that challenge and it was the middle of winter and it was horrific weather, it was like five degrees and it rained the whole time so and I had a cold and it was pretty tough but um, it sort of, I enjoyed that challenge, that physical and that mental sort of barrier so that's why I made the choice and um, I did live over in West Australia for four years when I was little, um, parents just wanted a lifestyle change, I picked up a, a citizenship there so I made the choice to come over to Australia. And so um, pretty um, back and forth across the ditch and I've spent more of my life now on, on this side rather than New Zealand but um, it's where you, you're know, born and sort of have your roots as well so and so Curtis uh, so you finish school you know you, you head into the military mm-hmm. and then what's how do you bridge from that time over to the Australian Defence Force where you, you started your I guess formal military career? Yeah well um, it's, it's a fairly simple sort of process um, I'm at the moment in the transitional period of getting out of the military and I found it uh, a little bit more difficult to get out than it is to get in but um, and that's just because we're trying to make sure that we're not leaving any loose ends and we're um, you know ticking all the boxes as, as we uh, sort of retire from military time but 
um, the transition into military um, is one of sort of shock and awe. Uh, it's meant to be like that. You get institutionalised and they sort of... Uh, I, hate to, I hate to use this saying because they sort of break you down and, and rebuild you, but in a way, not physically, but in a, a process and a system that has worked for centuries. And um, that's, that's sort of the, the breaking down and rebuilding, just the mentality behind the rules and regulations and you know, being punctual and, and wearing the right correct dress and having your weapon and, and your equipment squared away. And that's sort of that routine, that very regimental routine, which is the foundations of what most even organizations and businesses need to mm. to build themselves off so basic training is pretty difficult you know there's a lot of yelling and um the early mornings and uh long days and one thing I, I didn't realize about the uh basic training was you do a lot of like classroom work you sit in lecture theaters and death by light pro it's uh pretty pretty um intense and, and especially after early mornings and late nights and you're sitting in the classroom trying not to fall asleep so it's a it's a pretty difficult time <laughs> but um outside of that it's uh, good fun and you make some really great friends as well and so when you were uh you know starting to find your way your, your formative years in the military when you were a kid in Queenstown doing mm-hmm. all those activities uh did you show promise athletically back then I mean um, you st- strike me as a guy that probably athletically could do anything and apply yourself and do well yeah I guess yes um but at the same time I never gave myself the right drive and goals within each sport that I played um at school um you know I was doing a lot of different sports um you know trying to dabble in in everything that I could so um by doing that you sort of push to the side the, the opportunity that you could progress maybe even professionally in, in a sport and obviously in New Zealand rugby is the big one mm. um, and you know I played a bit of rugby at school and, and really enjoyed my time on the field but um, the in in New Zealand we don't have great big highways we have you know um, very difficult terrain to drive through and, and you see it on the map you're like oh yeah that'll take two hours but unknown to the, the <laughs> unwitting traveller is uh, that'll take three or four up to five hours just to get out of the mountains and down to the, the ocean just to where Dunedin is so that can you know that can take a toll on, on your day especially your weekend you know you spend a whole weekend a whole Saturday heading into a, a, a venue and, and that you know we whereas you know if you go snowboarding or, or in the kayak it's just there you're on it yeah um, and I really love the, the time in the kayak um, I got the opportunity at um, the branches a uh, year 10 school camp and that was the first time I jumped on a kayak and I loved it like I loved being on the water I loved that the the river is more stronger than you and it's mm. probably similar to what people get when they go surfing or this life saving they they understand the respect of of the ocean and, and vice versa with the the river and that um sort of resonated with me and you know trying to there's you know unwritten rules for mm. water sports and you need to respect them otherwise you'll you sort of come out second best always so uh, I really love the kayak and, and that um, sort of you know planted that seed for yeah. what I am up to now and so you know you had some degree of foundation there in the mm. craft in the yep. boat, you know in the, in the kayak even from those formative years yeah that's but right. I imagine at that stage of your life you could not have imagined you know no. what you would now be doing with the success and obviously no. that's come off the back of adversity but you know uh, that um there's something you look back on and you know I never would have thought I would have been an elite athlete you know gone to the Paralympics and and you know hanging out with the Olympians and all that sort of thing so for me to get the opportunity to to get to that level through the situation that happened in Afghanistan was you can't write that down you can't aim for that you can't see that you can't you know try mm-hmm. and achieve that it's just something that pops up with a, an opportunity and the timing I believe of my incident in Afghanistan was what sort of I could see where the opportunity was because of the the Olympics was just finishing uh, or had just finished and the Paralympics was building up with um, and the London Games in 2012 um, really put the Paralympics um, in the spotlight uh, mm. the 
the British um, media and the marketing around those London games was for, for the Paralympians was um, it was massive. Like it just changed the landscape of Paralympic sport. Yeah, absolutely. And so for listeners that aren't familiar, and it's, you know, with, as you refer to, the incident, Mm -hmm. it occurred in August 2012. But prior to that, you had been actively serving. You spent time, I believe, in Timor um, with Operation, uh, the name eludes me, I'm sorry, Curtis. Astute. Yep, Astute. Um, In your capacity uh, with your role. So can you just put listeners through a little bit of those Mm -hmm first years your formative years in the military up to Afghanistan yeah yeah so I enlisted in the Australian military as a combat engineer um, in 2006 in June and uh, I was posted up to Darwin my first unit after my all my training uh, I did uh, a training sort of trip to Malaysia for three months uh, doing uh, it was it's called rifle company Butterworth and we do a bit of jungle training and um, working with different nations as well. So that's um, probably the, the hardest physical thing that I've ever done in my life is the jungle training. It mm. is relentless and you have to consistently um, work just to, you know, hygiene or food or water. It, all the, the life basics are very difficult and you know we were just training. I'd hate to think what it was like for the guys in Kokoda and, and World War Two. It was in Vietnam as well. Like it would have been horrific. Um, and then uh, East Timor, uh, I got a deployment, an eight-month uh, deployment to East Timor uh, with Operation Astute in 2008 and 2009. Um, so that was a really great. I really enjoyed that um, deployment. Uh, I really we were there as a humanitarian. Uh, building, helping build infrastructure and water tanks for orphanages and medical centres and bridges for remote communities up in the mountains. Um, and I really felt like we made a, a positive engagement and contribution to the people of East Timor. We're working a little bit with the Timorese military and the police officers, so uh, you could really see the, what we had achieved there and hopefully uh, a legacy that all uh, Australia and East Timor will look back on with, with great pride. Um, and after that, I came back and we there was a little earthquake, well, a little, a large earthquake over in uh, Indonesia, and I jumped on uh, HMAS Kanimla and went over to Indonesia and oh, Padang Assist, mm. uh, which is where the um, uh, the earthquake, sort of the largest city. So we went in there and started making water and and uh, clearing landslides and because all the pipes and everything busted in the city. So um, we went over there and helped them out. Um, and I was only there for a couple of weeks and then came home um, and then I got to, uh, sorry, posted down to Brisbane at the 21st Construction Squadron uh, out at Brisbane and it's now currently out at Ipswich, they've moved but um, part of that we, we did um, what they call an ACAP and I can't remember what that acronym stands for it's uh, like an Aboriginal Assistance Program uh, it's been running for a, a number of years now uh, I'd say it'll be into its second decade of work and they go out into remote communities and build infrastructure and houses and, and facilities for the uh, remote communities in central Queensland and, and on the coast as well. So yeah. um, that's a, a very different sort of because there's like with over in the, the, um, the Asian countries that I've been to, they're very similar in their cultural sort of understandings, um, but in you know the Aboriginal culture is very, very different mm-hmm. from our. Our, our normality, so um, understanding their respecting their mm. their um, cultural differences is is quite you know it's it's really great to experience that and, and help be able to help them out. So, um, and then uh, I took some leave. Um, I took four months leave without pay and, and uh, went over to Europe and um, the Rugby World Cup in New Zealand in 2011 and. Um, I just wanted that time because I wasn't sure about what I wanted to do and you know, if I wanted to stay in the military and the job of, of a combat engineer is a lot of labouring work um, so the actual combat side of engineering is, is not implemented unless you're in a war zone so that can be uh, somewhat draining after you know just handing a, a spanner or a, a hammer to the actual carpenter or the plumber or whatever um, so that can be a little bit of a deterrent but there's always you know exciting things around the corner you never know what you're going to be doing the next day so and that and that's the the next thing is um 
I get the opportunity to get a deployment to Afghanistan in 2012. Mm. Um, so I came back from my leave and three days later I was out in Central Australia starting my high research training which is um, very intense and uh, the combat engineers that uh, go over to Afghanistan are some of the only um, troops that are certified to deploy. We have to go through a number of rigorous uh, training um, programs and then be assessed that we're competent enough to to be the front line. Um, yeah. So the role of a combat engineer in Afghanistan is to search the routes in front and, and search for the, the weapons um, that are being hidden, cache weapons, uh, whether it be componentry for IEDs or or you know, sh- guns and, and munitions. So it's a, a very different role from the... Um, humanitarian work that I'd done in the past so that sort of leads into the the combat side of things and that's why I said yes I sort of jumped at that opportunity because I considered it similar to to being on a rugby team or a netball team and you get to train and train and train with your teammates and you know I had a lot of friends that had deployed before before me um, from various units and um, you know you're sitting on the bench and watching your team go out and play and Mm and you don't really get to participate. So um, that's why I sort of said yes so quickly. So you didn't want to be the uh, spectator, you wanted to be uh, actively... Yeah. And I imagine you're the sort of guy that steps up to a challenge, you don't shy away from it. Yeah, um, I guess so. Like, I'm probably at that age, I was only 24 yep. when that was happening, So uh, or 23 when it, when it sort of had the opportunity in front of me. So um, you don't really realise who you, who you are or... What you, what, yeah. what you sort of goals are at that age so and especially for me who sort of bounced around at a different you know different locations and doing different things as well um, yeah. even within the military it's it's quite uh, you know, it's it's different yeah. when you get that sort of opportunity to do something you've been training for as well so you had the choice to go to Afghanistan it was yeah. a choice you could have said no but you said yes because yeah you, it, yeah. and it is frowned upon to say no. Yeah. Um, obviously, we, we sign up to serve yes. Australia and its um, you know, international commitments and, and what what yeah. whatnot. So, um, but at the same time, you know, there's circumstances where people you know they might have you know a sick kid at home yes. or um, you know there might be a single parent, so that might be really difficult for them. Um, so, you know, it, the dynamics of, of Australian society now sort of allows the, the option there. So, yep. um, you know, in each their own, and that's something that's. Um, yep. it, yeah, it's, it's an opportunity that, for me personally, I, I wanted to do. So, yeah. so, so you, you know, you're over in Afghanistan. <coughs> excuse me. You're in Afghanistan, and uh, and obviously, 23rd of August, the incident occurs. I know you've spoken at length around this, and you know it's well documented. So, um, you know, can you just put listeners a little bit in perspective of the incident? And the mm-hmm. bit that you know I know really made international, you know, certainly headline news, is what happened in the thirty odd minutes post the incident, the injury, yeah. that uh, really set the course of what would then occur in the next four years, leading into Paralympic gold. So, yeah, um, yeah. So obviously, I was over in Afghanistan. We're on a uh, clearance patrol. Where our task was to establish a checkpoint um, that was on top of a previously occupied checkpoint uh, by the Afghan police and they'd been pushed out by the insurgency in the area. Um, we deemed it important to re-establish this um, checkpoint because it was on a, a junction of two major valleys that led into different provinces um, and in order to um, influence the, the flow of traffic and um, making sure that the place is secure, this checkpoint was needed to be re-established. So we trundled off on a five-day patrol. It took us a fair few days to get onto the patrol, uh, onto the uh, checkpoint, um, due to the amount of IEDs that we were finding on the way in. And that's an acronym for uh, improvised explosive device yeah. or homemade landmine, yes. um, roadside bomb, etc. But it, it, there's a number of different types. Um, but the ones we were finding were hidden in the road, made for vehicles. We passed a number of blast craters and vehicle wreckage on the side of the road. Um, the Afghan police that were, were there, you, know, you could see that they had been through a, a bit of a, a crap time and, and a really rough time up there. And um, you know, the amount of blast craters was just phenomenal. So. Um, which was, you know, it's crazy that they would put up with, hopefully, like, not all the, the blast craters were people being killed or hurt um, because, you know, there's probably 30 or 40 up there and, and that, that's huge. Mm-hmm. So 
Um, anyway, we, we got up onto this checkpoint and we started to survey the area and uh, there was a lot of metal and debris that was sort of confusing or making us work twice as hard. We're doing probably 10,000 squats a day, um, picking up wow. picking up bits of metal, putting it back in our pocket, waving the metal detector again, so just to make sure there was nothing there. And um, the ground type was quite, quite coarse and granity, so it changes the way in which our metal detectors work. And, um, and we're working, you know, 14 hour days. It's, it's a very long, hot, you know, we were in body armor and have a weapon slung with us, uh, water bottles and a little bit of food. Um, the patrol commander you know, carries a radio as well. And we got these little um, small radios on us as well. So we're carrying a fair bit of kit. Um, but yeah, we continued on our job. And um, we, as we moved up to the checkpoint, we noticed that the main road that we had um, we had a big boulder blocking it so we had to find another way around we found another way around but then we sort of cleared the checkpoint we're like yeah cool we're going to start making this usable so we got approval to explosively remove this large boulder on the road and because I was so tired I, I went over to a different boulder that was blocking the service road the second road that we'd found um, on the checkpoint and I was sitting there waiting and um, I was asked to go and sort of recon, uh, survey how we were going to do it and if we could blow it and push it down the hill at the same time, um, that would be really good. But, um, at, you know, trying to, to achieve that was a big task, you know, working on 14 hours a day in um, hot, stressful conditions. So the, um, one of the, the, the guys from my brick uh, pitch, he came over to me, he goes, oh, what are you doing, you idiot? I was like, oh, and he's like, oh, the other rock. And I was like, oh, yeah, obviously. So I just stood up, and when you're tired, you don't really communicate as well. Um, so I stood up and just picked up my stuff. I wasn't searching at the time. I had my rifle in my right hand and my metal detector on my left all packed up, walking along. And um, pitch, um, I don't know what he was doing. Maybe he had a drink or something, but he was about 10, 15 metres behind me as we walked and and uh, when we move along a road or anything you try to keep minimum 10 metres di uh, distance in case uh, a, a blast goes off it doesn't hurt two people just yeah. tries and hurts well you try and get the the, the, the least and amount of yeah. casualties and that's what happened um, I stepped right on top of a, an improvised explosive device and it detonated beneath me um, snapped my rifle clean in half, um, obliterated my metal detector and um, I was, I don't remember the blast, I don't remember flying through the air, I don't even know if that happened. Um, I, there's no click, so a lot of people ask me, you know, you see these movies and the, the soldier will be walking along and they'll step on it and they'll hear a click. Mm. Most of the time that is not the case, mm -hmm. there is very, very few amount of munitions and mines that do that activation it was just step bang and it's there's no there's no time to react yeah put something on the the device to stop it from going off but um yeah so i sort of came to probably one second after the blast on the flat of my back open my eyes and there's dust and rocks and debris falling and i get up on my elbows and look down and my my legs are gone like completely gone um, I can see there's a fair bit of blood coming out of me and I was also the combat medic for my patrol so mm. I was talking the, the guys through the, the process of um, the first aid I yelled at Pitch to come over and try to put on a tourniquet on my legs because I tried to do it and I couldn't quite get it done because uh, every time I got off my elbows I kept falling back mm. so it was, it was quite a difficult time um, just physically trying to, and I didn't realise that my left hand was all broken and and you know um, fingers were all burnt and mm. I had big wounds on my arms. Um, so that was interesting because the the pain, you know, if you cut your finger, your fingers sore, or if you stub your toe, your toes sore. Mm. This pain was just everywhere. I couldn't, um, I couldn't, you know, under couldn't feel my legs. I couldn't feel my face in individual areas it was just everything um, it was sort of an attack on my whole body and um and that's why i was trying to use my hands and everything i wasn't aware of the other pain that I, or injuries that i had but then uh 
Pitch got on the first uh, 20k and the other guys got to me because they were down at the other rock waiting for me. And they started, they obviously came across me laying on the ground with no legs, it's quite a sight. So, um, you know, told them to bust out the, the, uh, the first aid kit and uh, we, they had what they call a kit explosion. We sort of gave it a name when you, you sort of open your bag and just it goes everywhere, just gear all over the ground and um, it... Uh, because of panicky hands? Yeah, exactly. Uh, um, you adrenaline? Know, trying to work fast and, and yeah, it just... <laughs> I, did, I quite remember the, the actual bag coming open and stuff just mm. going all over the floor. And, um, but uh, I, I could feel myself going into shock. I could, you know, short, sharp breaths and shaking and uh, the amount of blood I'd lost just in those few... Because your femoral arteries, right? Yeah, exactly yeah. that. And, um, you know, they just kept putting on tourniquets and tourniquets. You never take mm. off a tourniquet once it's on unless mm. you're a doctor and you've got clamps and surgeon, surgical equipment to do it. Um, so in the end, I had five tourniquets on me, um, three on my left leg, I think, and two on my right leg. Um, my right leg was amputated at the knee, and my left leg was amputated just below the knee. Yep. So, um, uh, and I had perforated eardrums, you know, broken multiple bones in my left wrist and hand, uh, burns on my uh, fingers. I had splinters from dirt and yep. um, wood and shards of all sorts of stuff. Um, large wound on my palm and um, yeah so it was a fit and I had some small shrapnel wounds on my back as well so it's a very extensive uh, injury the guys loaded me onto a stretcher and, and picked me up and carried me along and as they were carrying me to where the vehicles were all sort of parked up and made our sort of a safe harbour for the night time um, and where the helicopter was coming to, to come in um, they were carrying me along and you know, I said to them, you know, you'll, you'll see me in the Paralympics. Um, I did say, um, it won't be in the green and gold, it'll be in the black and white. And they, <laughs> and they said, oh, I suppose you can walk to the chopper then. So they, you know, in the, the nature of um, an event like that is, is traumatic for everyone. And, and it's interesting that the human sort of mind, and, and I don't know if this is all cultures and... and um, races throughout the yeah. world do they use black humor but yeah. australians and new zealanders definitely do so um and that was that was the case so we we're joking you know losing brand new boots and things like that so um you know, just making light of the situation as well because that that situation was not just my traumatic experience everyone that witnessed it you know they had blood on their hands and they had things that they had done for me mm. um you know themselves and, and they they were, you know, dealing with that too, so... Yeah, and, and I mean, so your thought was of others. When you said that, Curtis, I mean, the origins of that, I mean, is that a... Does pure <clears throat> black humour find light in a very traumatic situation? Or, I mean, I think the proof's in what then occurred. Mm. Was that a stirring and knowing almost instantly that it's like a prophetic word that, you know what, uh, you're an optimistic guy, you're a guy of great capacity... Um, just unfathomable for most to be able to even imagine that in that moment of trauma you're already just setting a goal almost yeah. was it a reaction do you think it was more humor or it was actually like something just coming out of you like no i'm you'll see me at the paralympics it's... um well yeah I, I guess that there's there's two ways to look at it there is like you said an optimistic opportunity that has presented itself to me um but i don't know like whether you know that was spirit of the moment comment or whether it was something that I could use or I could look at for the future. Um, I didn't know how I was going to do that. I wasn't really on top of my list of priorities at that moment. But um, the, it planted the seed, you could say. Um, and it wasn't until I, you know, nearing the end of my um, rehabilitation, I was out of hospital and so nearing the end of my rehab and started to investigate in different sports and you know I could probably do this so um, and I couldn't see myself doing anything else other than the sport so that when that occurs you can really see that this is probably the right choice and you know I didn't really want to go to work I just wanted to to do sport and I saw sport as a great opportunity for more recovery and rehabilitation as well yeah um, so that's um, sort of what led me on the path that I'm on. And uh, what was uh, 
Before we move off the incident, thanks for sharing so detailed around it, Curtis. Uh, the gentleman with you, what was their response when you said you'll see me at the Olympics? Can you remember? The Paralympics. Yeah, I don't know. They, um, I can't really remember what, what they said to me after it, but I guess you know, when, when you come back from patrol um, and the Olympics is on, you're turning on the TV and you're watching you know, whatever was on the, the athletics, the weightlifting, rowing, whatever... So um, they understood probably why I said that, but maybe they were just as doing it, saying stuff just like I was. Mm. You know, you'll be right. You know, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, good one. Yeah, um, but I, yeah, I can't quite remember. It gets a bit hazy when I start thinking about that. But yeah, I guess. Um, I guess you weren't monitoring their reactions. No, it was life no. and death, right? So. Yeah, that's right. Curtis, your rehabilitation, I know it's extensive and it's, you know, as a physiotherapist and myself and having worked with a young gentleman who lost limbs in a crane incident years mm. ago and, you know, the, and had prosthesis, there's more to it than, okay, you've had an amputation, stick a prosthesis on and you're right. Yes. There's fit-ins, there's refit-ins, there's stump wound management, there's yeah. yep. phantom limb pain. And I think the, the, you know, outside looking in could so easily just assume, well, you're right, mate, you've got your limbs, and then you get trained up and off you go. But outside of the athletic effort, pursuit, talent, it's obviously taken your Paralympic gold and world championship titles, you must even now still have such a degree of medical management around the, the stumps and the wounds yeah. that, that you don't report onto the outside world, right? No, that's right. And, and your your comment about you know just get some prosthetic legs and off you go is exactly what I thought was going to happen. Mm. Um, and I got a big kick in the face when when I went and got those prosthetic legs mm. and I stood up in them and I had nerve issues and mm. fitting issues and sizing and it's. Your, your stumps will never maintain a, a set volume or um, sort of pressure. Mm. They will change ebbs and flows um, with humidity and heat, um, with activity um, and time in and out of the legs and, and altitude as well mm. um, on planes that can change it too. So you really have to um, manage that. And one thing you have to get set is your skin. Your skin's a big... Mm. a big uh, issue f- well it is for me um, the skin needs to be you know clean um, you know people ask me you know do I walk into the shower I was like no I need to clean my my legs because um, they're important that they keep clean and, yeah. and you, know, you check over the, the scar tissue and I've got a large um, skin graft in the back of my right leg which means that I can't feel that skin so I need to look at it and check it and mm. luckily enough my uh, my fiance she's a doctor so she That's she funny. can we'll give it the once over if there's some an issue but the phantom limb pain is um, something that a lot of people ask me about and that for me has not been too bad I I get very minimal phantom limb pain but um, because of my activity I get a lot of sort of skin issues and ingrown hairs because of the pressure in which I weight bear is different from, from what you and the rest of uh, the, the leg people <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, do. So um, that's something that needs to be managed quite extensively um, with you know, um, a doctor and the prosthetist is probably the main point of call there. Um, and one thing that I wasn't really aware of is that when you, when you lose your limbs, your, your hips, well, you would understand this, your hips would change, your posture changes, so lower back pain's mm. prevalent, yep. um, pretty much all double amputees or even single amps. Um, the, your hips and, and your, your core changes in the way you move and, and how I swing my right leg is with my glutes and my upper back, and my lower back, so that changes in which, where your strength and needs, and you need to be strong in those areas. So. A lot of physio, um, once I got prosthetic legs, we, we sorted out the nerve issue um, and then got, got onto the, the stairs and stepping over things and walking long distances and, and that was really good. But um, one thing that I hate about prosthetics, especially bilateral amputation, is that the heat and like, you know, it's so hot these days. Um, this summer it's been a bit of a scorcher and um, the skin that I have to dissipate the heat or radiate the heat mm. 
is covered in carbon fibre and silicon and mm. that doesn't breathe, it doesn't radiate, it doesn't uh, cool in any way. So that's really uh, a difficult point. You know, I get sweaty and I, my temperature regulation changes a lot. So um, you know, the missus, she's always complaining about me having the air con at minus 30. So, um, <laughs> but that's just um, how I feel comfortable. So, But we're not letting you out of Queensland, yeah. uh, Curtis. Nah, you're an yeah. honorary Queenslander for no, life. I don't mind it here. It's pretty good. I've got a pool now, so it's not too bad. Beautiful. And listen, as you can see, Curtis, on his swan in the pool on our <laughs> <Yeah>. Instagram. <laughs> and just on the, before we move into the, the performance side of things, Curtis, the, the uh, technologies of the prosthesis is mm. obviously above knee and then below knee. Yes. Just put listeners in perspective with some of the state of the art technology that accompanies those yeah so the, the baloney is actually quite simple um i use the the flex and um the rebound of carbon fiber in my in the feet area so they're just sort of lengths of very hard strong carbon fiber um and then it leads up into a pylon that gives me the right length of leg and then it goes into a socket that just sort of it's a bit of a cup you could say that goes around the, the bottom part and then i have my 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 left knee is, is mine so I can use it and it's probably my stronger um, leg now because of the use in which I put it through is, um, is definitely different from what it was before because I'm a right footer, right handed mm. um, so that's all changing but my right leg on the other hand is, is completely different I don't have my own knee there I have a prosthetic knee, it's called an X um, I have an X3 as well and X3 is the top of the line at the moment um, I've just had a, a change in, in the, the alignment so my X3 has got uh, dress shoes on it so they've got a large heel so that, that means that the, the alignment's different you can't just swap the shoe uh, willy nilly you need to assess that and change it but um, yeah the, the X3 is waterproof it's made by a company called Autobot which I'm sure most prosthetists uses mm -hmm. and either orthotics and wheelchairs they, they understand mm -hmm. that Autobot's a, a huge company and they've invested in, in the US military have invested millions and millions probably over a billion dollars wow. easily in the last sort of four years for prosthetic development um, and orthotics um, in order to help the military members initially get into they're back to you know fighting health yep. um you know back to the activities that they used to do and enjoy and there are some guys that go back to the military yeah. um there's a, a guy um that continued in, in his a different role in the military in australia here um and, and that's because the technology has allowed him to to keep up or, or do a different activity in a different way or you know the fitness standards in a different way so and it's strange, like a lot of the military members that get prosthetics, you don't see them, you know, put the prosthetic leg on and, and sit at home and, and put on some weight. And yeah. they're quite active guys yeah. um, and you get out there and, and make most of life. So, um, yeah, so the, the X, X2 knee or X3 knee, it's um, a great it's a microprocessor knee it's got 16 sensors and, and four microprocessors and it. it's got a bit of bluetooth so i can change modes and things like that to cycle mode and i can make lock the leg so it doesn't bend but um it's one of the first knees that the genium knee um going back a few generations now and knees is the first um, microprocessor knee that can go step over step yeah. um up, upstairs and, and that's um something that because i don't have calf muscles i can't you know, sort of plantar flex and, and push myself up. Yep. Um, so that's a great sort of feature that allows me to do it. But because I'm a bilateral amputee and I don't have calves, it, it makes it harder. So uh, having a hand around is always necessary. So, but yeah, the, and the, the most important part of a prosthetic limb is the socket. And it's the yeah. part that is custom made to the individual. Um, they need to be molded in a way that fits them comfortably it fits them for long use uh, long periods of time um, the the current socket that I have on now it's got this bower dial and it tightens up on the, the sides because I've got the lower condyle yeah. of my right leg and, and that means it's got an hourglass shape so in order to fit into a carbon fiber socket that's solid yeah. I need windows that expand so I can get that condyle past it so 
I have this dial and I put my leg in and um, slide it in and, and wind the dial up and it clamps it nice and tight so it can't come off, which is you know, a great feature, but yeah. um, it's, it's far from perfect and yeah. it's always going to evolve into something that's going to be better the next day. You're listening to Curtis McGrath, OAM, six times world champion and Rio Paralympic Games champion in the KL200 sprint canoe. We're talking about Curtis's highs, lows and the learnings of his amazing career to date. Support for today's show comes from Normatech Recovery. Normatech is the leader in rapid recovery systems designed to give a competitive edge to the world's elite endurance athletes. The Normatec Pulse Recovery Systems are dynamic compression devices designed for recovery and rehab. The Normatec Recovery Boots use their patented pulse technology to help athletes recover faster between workouts and after performance by reducing muscle soreness and improving circulation. It's simple, get fresh legs faster with Normatec. Jump over to alphasport.com.au for more information about Normatec recovery boots and technology. Support for today's episode also comes, as always, lovingly from Pogo Physio. We exist to help you get back to your physical best following injury. We want everyone who walks through our doors at Pogo Physio to cross their physio finish line. That's where we high-five you and tell you that you've finished rehabilitation and celebrate you getting back to your physical best. We do this through session-to-session care, our one-hour initial Discover Recover sessions, industry-first ways of accessing services such as our 2, 6, and 12-week fixed-fee unlimited access finish line programs, and now our very popular monthly wellness booster packages where patients of the practice get access to physiotherapy, remedial massage services, clinical Pilates, and other active rehabilitation services, all for low monthly set fees. For more information, jump over to pogophysio.com.au. For now, let's jump back with Curtis McGrath. Curtis, your mindset, I mean, around uh, how you've turned adversity you know trial and triumph uh, I think just speaks volumes of who you are but also that's the bit that I know people just are so inspired by and I loved in on your Instagram post Curtis uh, you'd, you'd written here the 23rd of August 2012 this is me getting airlifted it's a photo of you getting airlifted by the gentleman uh, to the next stage in my life five years today since life threw me a huge curveball this day doesn't haunt me nor does it define me We'll have to look at what is ahead of us and accomplish what we can with our short lives because we never know when those curveballs come at us. Massive thank you to everyone who helped me that day. I would not be here otherwise. It's your five-year anniversary, so it's the 23rd of August 2017, Mm. uh, only a few months ago from the time of today's recording. But that line, this day doesn't haunt me, nor does it define me. Um, What do you mean by that? I guess there's um, a number of different ways in which adversity can can give to you or make you, um, uh, there's a, you know, there's a strange way in which adversity can either f- put a full stop on, on whatever you are trying to do or whatever you, wherever you're going, but at the same time, there's a, another door open and defining moments like that. Yes, it does define me in a certain way, but it also doesn't because it opens up all these opportunities. So you got to look at what you have rather than what you don't have. Um, Would you people say that you're a natural optimist? Because you must have your, your really down days. Oh, of course, yeah. Um, and, and that's yeah, everyone has down days, and that's um, a part of life. And the, there's that there's always that old saying that you know, failure is the best type of learning, it's the best teacher. And I don't necessarily think of that as failure, but that is it's a negative it's a massive negative um and so is failure so therefore when you look at adversity and that especially that incident there is a number of things that could have happened that made me not come home that day yeah. there, and that didn't happen but because of the things that did i am here and i've got all these opportunities so you have to really look at what you have and you know i 
pretty got a pretty cool life now. I get to travel around the world and, and kayak and meet people and hang out with Prince Harry and, and <laughs> all sorts of stuff. So there's a number of different things that have happened for the, for the better, for sure. And certainly uh, Prince Harry, I mean, let's go there. There's a great photo on your Instagram gallery, so listeners, jump over and, and check Curtis out. Give him a follow. It's fantastic. Uh, what did Prince had it? That's through the Invictus Games work, great, and I think yeah. you were over in uh, Canada at the time. Is that, yeah, and uh, so what was it like meeting the Prince? What did he say? And it, it, Yeah, so I've, I've met uh, Prince Harry a couple of times now, and in order to do with the um, Invictus Games. Um, Invictus Games is a a Paralympic style event for wounded, injured and ill. Um, this, uh, sorry, 2018, it'll be coming to Sydney. Um, you should watch out for some tickets there. It'll yep. be a great event. Um, the Prince is, he's made a huge change in the way rehab and, and how we can use sport um, uh, as an aid to our rehabilitation. Um, and that's something that I've literally done. Like there's not one part of that statement that's not a part of me so um, for him to come along and, and have this idea of making this global um, games that incorporate a lot of the countries throughout the world I think this year it had 17 I think next year it's got 16 there's, there's always people um, teams coming in and out um, uh, so next year we've got Poland um, attaching on to the, the, um, the competition which is really great um, and it's mainly the countries that have um, contributed to the war in the Middle East um, and uh, tried you know, with helping with the stabilisation over there. And it, we had the Afghan teams, we have an Iraq team, um, Jordan. There's you know, a number of different teams that you wouldn't think of, Estonia and, and Denmark. And you know, it's, a, it's a great sort of coming together of um, all these people that have very similar stories. And it's not about winning the medal, it's about participating and, and showing that we've overcome what's happened to us and what we've experienced in life and in our service as well so you know the prince is a great guy and he's he's very relatable in terms of his service and and how he talks to you and and sometimes you know you get this sort of perception of of those royals or someone in that that type of position that maybe talk down to you or talk to you in a way it makes you feel um insignificant but he's because he's so relatable and we have similar experiences it, it's really great and, and he's you know a great person to to promote and um the Invictus Games and onto the uh the, the plight of, of a wounded injured nil veteran and uh Curtis I mean you mentioned it's not about the medals in that capacity yeah. I know you did incidentally take out gold in a four minute uh row indoor never, never again and the one minute indoor row never again why just the lactate was oh, to through the roof I've, yeah <laughs> From physical exercise, that is the worst I've ever felt. I couldn't get off the floor for about 15 minutes after. I didn't know whether I was going to pass out, crap myself, or, <laughs> or, or, or vomit. I just, I was so full of lactate that I was cooked, absolutely cooked. And uh, yeah, it took me a fair bit to, to scrape myself up and walk up into the grandstands because, yeah, I, for, for me, rowing, I don't use my legs, so I'm, I'm bolted in. I have a seat that doesn't move, um, and I just lean over at the waist and pull. And uh, I was with this, uh, up against this uh, this Great Britain dude that uh, looked like King Kong, and, and he was massive, and, and he came out of the gates flying, and I could see him on the, the ergo screen that tells you who's in front and who's behind you. He was way ahead of me, and I was like, oh, I'm not, I don't know <laughs> if I'm going to get him, but if I hold back and then just hook in at the end... <laughs> and, it, and it, I only beat him by one metre so one metre you know one metre over a four minute row which is you know, it's yeah not, it's yeah. very close tight and uh, but uh, yeah I, I think that's my official retirement of, of indoor rowing it just stung way too much <laughs> just, I couldn't believe it and then I mean other medals Curtis and there, there's such a bio that you're developing mm. you've won multiple world titles you defended your world title there's two golds this year I believe in 2017 mm. at the world uh, championships uh, prior to that also world championship success and I know we're leaving out many chapters <clears throat> there was 2015 where your craft shifted uh, yeah, yeah. a little bit on that what, what happened there for yeah. listeners so in 2014 you know it was my debut year into to para canoeing and elite kayaking and, and canoeing and um, the V1 was the, the chosen craft for my disability so the V1 is a VAR canoe an outrigger canoe um, it doesn't have a rudder it's got a single blade canoe paddle um, it's got a little um, armour which is the outrigger on the side and um, it uh, was the f- 
craft that I completely focused on and that made it uh, quite quite great that I could come in eight, eight months after picking it up and, and win the world champs. It's like, you beauty, I'm onto a good thing here. I can, uh, mm. should go into Rio, should be, should be a breeze. And then, you know, that was in August. And then in uh, February 2015, the International Paralympic Committee decided to change the, uh, the craft for the Paralympics. So the reason why they did that was this, the classification process wasn't as, as solid as what they hoped it would be at that stage. So they had to swap it. And I understand that, but just the timing was really bad for me. You know, a couple of weeks later, I had the first selection event for the national team and they changed it to the kayak and still 200 meters, still same athletes, same disability type and class and everything. But it was a huge upsetting moment because I th- you know, I assumed and mm. you know, assumptions of the mothers of all stuff up so that can be um, a big lesson there you know you can't assume anything until you're sitting on the start line of, of, of the Paralympics uh, knowing that that's the event you're in and even you know, injuries on the day or yeah. when your paddle could snap it's just one of those things you just need to um, accept that that change was for the better for everyone and um, the reason why I say it's for the better is because my disability is in the middle. It's the KL2 or VL2, and there's VL3 and 1. And VL1 is uh, the the lower, the least able yes. um, classification. VL3 or KL3 is the most able. So if someone was to train continuously for a number of four years, um, say, and they are being in VL2 and they get better, they you know their back starts healing. There's a, an athlete that that's happened to from GB. Um, Jonathan Young and his his spine is starting to slowly repair itself through yeah. nerves and everything and he's bumped up so if he committed himself to all that training and then all of a sudden he's in a, a, a kayak yep. the day before the well not the day it wouldn't happen but a couple of months before the Paralympics kicks off and he's at a massive disadvantage so um, they sort of brought it back a bit made it all level uh, everyone's in the same craft so same type of boat uh, that's the reason why I, I can understand the change um, yeah, and then that was that was pretty tough. So, but you felt like all the energy and effort you'd put into, and yeah. uh, you know, I've heard you say that you felt like it was almost wasted. You wasted your time, mm. and, and your coach Andrea King broke that news to you. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, so, how quickly were you back in the wa- on the water uh, in the new craft in the car? So I got um, a phone call. That that phone call, Andrea called me up on Sunday night at like nine thirty or nine o'clock at night to tell me and. Um, it's, you, know, you don't really get phone calls from your coach at 9 o'clock on Sunday when you're meant to be at training. Um, <laughs> 4 30 in the morning. Yeah, yeah, the next morning. And, you know, it was a bit odd, but um, obviously I got to training that morning and, and still jumped in the V1. But I, I remember remember vividly coming in after that session and pulling up to the beach, just with a sand beach there, and, and wanting to get my paddle and just smash it on the boat. I, yeah, I was quite annoyed. Um, but that afternoon I started in the kayak and um, you know I'd done a little bit of whitewater kayaking but a sprint kayak so much different they're so much tippier they're lighter they're they're faster but um, yeah just the balance it's just so different so that was a big big change and, and from that point I pretty much did maybe two sessions in the v1 a week and mm. everything else was kayak and a little bit more so I was doing sometimes four sessions in a day. It was wow. yeah, it was full on. So it was almost like cramming, was it? Yeah, it was cramming because I had, only had two and a half weeks until my first selection event. And wow. um, fortunately, there's there's uh, there's only one other athlete in my class in Australia um, at that time, and I pushed through and, and managed to, to beat him at that event. So it was the first tick in the box, and then it sort of for Rio. progressively got better. Well, just the selection for the team because. That was the qualifying first qualifying year in 2015, and okay. I went over to, to World Champs in, in Milan. I had a, quite a good race, I thought, um, but I had a lot of uh, things I needed to, to get better at, a lot of um, you know, points that needed to improve, and um, getting that silver medal was uh, something behind Marcus Mendy Swoboda from Austria. He's, that was his sixth World Champion metal like he's a bit of a legend when it comes to the power canoeing side he's just so dominant he started paddling when he was eight years old and 
Um, he paddled for Austria and down to 23 able-bodied squads. So wow. he's, he's uh, it's class. He's, he's world class, yeah. And that's the gentleman for listeners that you beat in the Paralympics for the gold medal. Yeah, that's correct. And um, he, he's make it worse. He's a really nice guy. And, <laughs> yeah, I really did feel for him um, when you know 2016 was the year that I'd found my groove and I'd found my strengths and I'd, my weaknesses were getting s- smaller and smaller and. Um, it just the timing was right for me and um, you know put in all the work and that was, it was starting to pay off. So you win the Paralympic gold and I know mm-hmm. we're leaving out a lot of the story yeah. but uh, I'm curious to know Curtis uh, the first thing that your parents said to you and also the first words you spoke with your Afghanistan Australian Defence Force mates who uh, yeah. um, who heard you prophetically say you'll see me at the Paralympics. Yeah, the, the the boys had been on the terps, but um, <laughs> it was like nine thirty in the morning, and they'd got stuck in, and they they were having a great time, and they made the atmosphere of the crowd lift up, and the Brazilian people got around it, and I think the Australians had the largest uh, cheer squad uh, outside of the Brazilian the home home team, so um, and it was, it was great to have them there, and I can't quite remember what I said to them, but uh, yeah, they yeah. Congratulations all round, really, and you know um, a few things that I said to them. You know, part of you, this is partly yours, and you know, these are the this moment is is not just mine. It's it's all the people that were there and, and a few that weren't. So, um, and it's the same. With the mum, mum and dad were like over the moon, I think, mm. and you know, they lots of hugs and, <laughs> and congratulations, and it was. It was a great moment, yeah. And that picture of you on the dais, I mean, it was just everywhere in Australian media, and mm. I think it almost transcended the whole Olympic year, yeah. it was like the moment. Um, I mean, in your your mind, you're on the dais. What's going through your head on the dais is Australian anthems playing? An oh, extremely proud moment. You know, I set out... I'll just go back, like, maybe 10 minutes of that moment, and, and when I actually crossed the line, um, you know... I, at the 100 metres to go, it was neck and neck, and then 50 metres to go, I could no longer see anyone. So I had a feeling that I was going to win. But you never you never give up on that moment. You never celebrate too early. And you see a number of times that that happens, especially in cycling. They get a bit carried away on the Tour de France, and <laughs> and uh, old mate coming up behind, and they're just not looking. Um, but, yeah, you committed to the, the race and, and crossed the line, and I, I had this... I expected to feel like celebration, excitement, and joy, and but what I what I got was relief. I didn't feel any of those expected emotions, and it was just relief that I'd set out to go to the Paralympics. I'd achieved it, and then to get first in you know the the debut, in the first gold medal uh, for my class um, at the Paralympics in Parakano, it was just like this this wave. Um, and it was a strange feeling. And I turned back around and I looked at Marcus, and he was just a, a defeated man. And I could see the hurt and the emotion in him. And mm. I paddled over to him, and uh, next to him, I gave a hug, and I said, "This sport wouldn't be the same without you." And uh, yeah, he was. He was. I thought he was going to cry, but um, he, you know, he's someone I've looked up to you know, and I still do because he's such a great person and a great athlete and he continues to push me um, the gap's closed and he's, he's fixing his weaknesses and um, even with the V1 um, coming into Tokyo but being up on that podium was when, when the joy started happening the excitement and the celebration and you know being able to be a part of that and um, Nick Byton, the guy from Great Britain he got third and he was over the moon he wasn't, wasn't too sure about his ability to get there as well and, and the realisation of everyone who, who was standing on the podium that we'd achieved that and, and got mm. got a gold, silver or bronze was, was really great and, and that's the thing with sport, you know, you, the uh, the people on the podium and the people in your events as well, they, they have a celebratory moment together, um, whether it's on the line at the start line or when you cross the line everyone's sort of kudos to the the winners and and kudos to the people who come last because they've all achieved it for their country and it's very much uh at any level isn't it it's that yeah it's right connection around pushing the limits and Mm -hmm. there's that respect for your competitors that's like everyone's bought their best today and this is the standout at the end of the day
You're listening to Curtis McGrath, OAM, six times world para canoe champion and 2016 Rio Paralympic champion in the KL200 event. If you missed last week's episode, episode 94, featuring dual Slovakian Olympic triathlete Richard Varga, the fish of the World Triathlon Series, then be sure to jump back across to the archives of the show and tune in to Richard Varga. On last week's episode, Richard shares around his top three tips to help anyone looking to swim faster, swim faster. He also shares the highs, the lows, and the learnings of his career to date, looking ahead to Tokyo 2020, training with the Brownlee brothers in the lead up to their 2012 and 2016 successful Olympic campaigns and so much more. Here's a little snippet from Richard Varga. That's what I had to learn when I was going from the swimming background to the triathlon background, that in the open water, you need a much, much higher cadence if you if you want to swim with these guys because when you look some some uh, swimmers come swim with trophies and they are maybe two classes better swimmers but they very average in the open water so i think this is the cadence stuff and then the other hand would be i think the kick work i think lots of people saying that uh, you don't you don't have to train kick too much in my opinion is yes you have to go training to have a, as much as, as possible efficient kick to tune into the full episode and explore the archives of the physical performance show be sure to jump over to pogophysio.com.au or of course your favorite podcast player now let's jump back to curtis mcgrath So, Kurt, of all your, we're going to throw straight into a performance round. Of all your yeah. training sessions, what's the training session that you most dislike? Uh, um, I think it'd probably be we do a session, we haven't been doing them for a while, but uh, it's called 2K Tuesday, and it's two or three, uh, no, it's actually three or four two, 2K efforts with the turn, so it's a thousand meters up, turn around and come back uh, as solid, so as hard as you can. And it's, it's uh, not a great feeling once you come back down, and or even when you're on your way up, knowing that you got to come back, and yeah, it's a it's a bit of a slog that one. And uh, what's the training session you most love? So that's the most dislike. What's the training um, session you most love? I think on Fridays we usually do like a, a thousand meter style session, so it'll be like six one thousands um, at 80, 80 stroke rate, eighty um, percent, and. Um, and it could be you know 750s as well but it's just round about that that sort of area is what I like and I think my body style you know I'm quite a tall person I'm more uh, attuned to a longer distance um, uh, sort of discipline um, as opposed to 200 meters although you know, 200 meters is the event that's been selected so um, yeah the, the longer stuff I actually prefer a bit more strategy involved with it. Kurt, what's your pre-race meal look like? So you wake up uh, that morning mm. uh, in Rio. Can you remember what time did you paddle? What time was the, the final? And can you remember what you had for breakfast? So we were getting up really early in Rio. Um, our races were about 9, 9.30 in the morning. Um, and due to the traffic in Rio, the, on a good day, it could take 45 minutes to get to the course. And on a bad day, it could take three hours. So we were up really early. Um, up about 4.30. Uh, the, the meal hall in, in the Olympic Village is open 24-7, so we whipped in there before we jumped on a bus, and I just had, um, I believe I just had um, a bowl of cereal because I'm sort of a bit plain when it comes to breakfast in the morning. What sort oh, of cereal? Uh, it's something like Just Right, that sort of style. Um, I don't know what it was over there. It came out of a like a, <laughs> a bucket type thing. So <laughs> bucket. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, just a, a bowl of cereal and some some milk, and um, probably just had a, a big water. Uh, the coffee in the village was horrific, so I didn't touch any of that. So <laughs> what was yeah. horrific about it? Oh, I just it, like that percolated sort of drip. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't great. And the, the milk that they had with the coffee that came out automatically was like this powdered stuff. It just wasn't, it wasn't <laughs> great. So but around the corner from the, the course, there was this um, Australian sort of run cafe, which was quite funny. Um, it was sort of 
you know, chockers all the time with all the Australians and New Zealanders getting their coffee there. I can't it was called. Was it just for the Olympic Games? No, no, and they'd been there a couple there. of years. Yeah, yeah, um, right, yeah, run by a couple of Aussies, and they had Ed's, Eggs Benedict and things like that, which is unheard of over there. They don't, they don't eat that type of food, so so you're hooking <laughs> in. Cool. And then, Kurt, uh, what's your sleep hygiene like? You're quite disciplined around getting to bed, waking up. I mean, what's um, a classical day look like for you, bedtime wise? Um, yeah, I guess um, I try to get to, to bed around 9, 9.30. Um, hopefully I'm asleep by 10. Um, and then, you know, on an average day, I'm up at quarter to five, um, walking out the door at sort of 20 past five, and then on the water at quarter to six. So um, it's a fairly structured morning process up straight away. And my alarm goes off, and I, I don't touch the snooze button. I'm up and, and out. So um, it... it it doesn't make it uh, easy with with the missus, and she's a doctor, and she, we work sort of shifts in the night shifts, if, if you could say. And so she gets home around you know nine nine thirty, and um, I'm already in bed, and and then we're swapping out. So, um, but like I have found myself being able to train quite well when I'm really really tired. Um, you know, if I have a bad night's sleep, I'm actually I perform a bit better, and I don't know why that is. Um, and my coach doesn't really know either. It's just sort of something that I can do. But, you know, in saying that, if I have a bad night's sleep, you know, the next next night might be really good. So, um, and that's just the nature of sport, I guess, and ups and downs of fatigue and, and process. That's, a, that's a quite interesting, though. How do you know you're trying better time? Because your times reflect that? Times, or? times and my technique. And I think maybe part of that would be my mentality of it it's like oh you know just get here and let's just get this over with so, so I get in there and hook in and do it and then I can go home and chill out so it might, it might be that thinking because you know you wake up really tired you want to go back to sleep but yeah um, I have a little bit of a a thought process in the morning when when I wake up and you know you don't want you're tired or you don't want to go or it's raining outside or you know in the middle of winter it can get no, it's not that cold, but it, it's cooler than it is right now. Um, you know, world champions don't sleep in, so um, they, they uh, you know, you got to get up, you got to do the work, and that's that's what makes it all pay off. I love that world champions don't sleep in. I'll remember that next time I'm. Uh, yeah. but, but if I'm not a world champion, I can uh, I can have the morning off, yeah. right, mate? Uh, who's the uh, athlete you most admire, Curtis McGrath, and why? Um, oh, he's not an athlete anymore. Um, his name is Richard McCaw. Um, I'm a Kiwi and by birth, and obviously the All Blacks get drummed into you. Um, his willingness to sort of put himself through the hurt locker in order to achieve the goal, uh, not only for himself but the team and, and the country, is, is uh, probably. You know, I don't really know many people that put themselves through that. You know, playing a whole World Cup with a broken foot and. You know, he's just a bit of a bit machine, and even on Christmas Day, he was out there fighting fires in New Zealand in his helicopter. So yeah, he's a bit of a, a, he's a New Zealand icon, is he? Yeah. I, I was in New Zealand November 2016 when the earthquake happened down that South Island. Yeah. Um, I was in Auckland, and uh, I recall seeing Richard Rich on the news, and he yeah. was like flying yeah. his chopper down to help out in Kaikoura. Yep. Kaikoura. Kaikoura. Yep. Kaikoura. Yep. And I thought, wow, he's a, he's a real statesman for the country. Yeah, he? he's a bit of like this sort of genuine Kiwi sort of bloke. You could, all, you wouldn't be able to pick that he was, you know, all black yeah. captain and, and world champ, double world champion. So he's got that humility. <laughs> yeah. Who's the toughest competitor you've ever raced against? Curtis and oh, I, it would have to be um, my main competitor currently and has been for the, the past sort of four years and that's Marcus Mendy Swoboda from Austria um, silver medalist yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so he's um, he's always been a, a strong paddler you know he competed under 23s for Austria in the opens um, in a K2 boat so he's he's very well established um, you know he's been doing that sport since he was about 10 years old yeah um, and what I, what I like about our disability class is that all the people on the podium at the moment are pretty very similar in their disability. Um, you know, we're all missing a limb or our legs don't work almost entirely. So um, for us to all be, you know, at the, the top end of our disability class, and that's the thing about um, Paralympic sport, and some people don't quite understand that. Like, um, for instance, people ask me why didn't I get into swimming, and um, uh, swimming 
in my disability class, I would be in the lower end of the ability side mm. of my disability class for the swimming activity. So, for instance, um, I'm a bilateral leg amputee. So when I get into the water, I can't kick. So my legs don't work like that. So, but they what they do because my legs are so long, my residual limbs, they um, give me a lot of drag in the water. So you want quite high amputation so therefore that would put me up into the higher end of the disability class and it's the same with all sports um, in the Paralympic world is that you know coaches and and talent ID staff are looking for those athletes in that top tier that top sort of little bracket on the verge of being into the next disability class because that's where you get your highest performance your best performers out of so me Marcus and there's a the bronze medalist from the UK Nick Byton another um IED, um, really? Uh, uh, blast from from Afghanistan. Afghanistan yeah, as well. he's an engineer as well, um, wow. and he got bronze. So we're all in the same sort of boat um, in terms of l- missing limbs. And, um, and what about Marcus? Was because so, so if I heard correctly, Curtis, Marcus, your main competitor, mm-hmm. the gentleman who hadn't been defeated, and he knocked him off for yep. the gold medal in Rio. He was an elite under twenty three junior. Yes. Uh, with no restrictions, no disability, and then an incident happened? Or no, 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 he was, he was, he was uh, disabled. He um, got injured in a farming incident when yeah. he was eight years old. Yeah. So um, for him to compete at the open level, at the under-23 level as well, um, is pretty amazing with no legs. Mm. So he's got an adaption in his boat just like I do yeah. in my boat, um, and he'll lock in and, and off he goes. And you know, he's, he's a bit shorter than me. Um, he's a bit stockier than me, so... Yeah. His ability to um, to get a higher stroke rate, he's very, very good out of the, the start gates. So um, he's able to keep up a stroke rate with the you know a fully able bodied person um, in a K two boat, which is you know kayak two wow. person. So yeah, he's so quite a competitor. You is. say adaption. Mm. What, what does that look like for listeners? I mean, what what do you mean by he's got an adaption in his boat? Yeah. So um, for kayaking it's there's craft. no um regulations about what we can adapt inside the boat as long as it doesn't provide artificial um propulsion i.e putting a little motor in or um you know having a a little sort of electronic rudder system that um would you know, assist that person in, in getting down the lane but um the the adaption, for instance, my adaption is um, it's a cut up old carbon bike frame and then it's got some sockets from my old prosthetics sort of moulded on um, to the side of that and then that bolts into the inside of my boat. Wow. Um, so you can lift up my boat with that. You can just grab it and lift it up. It'll, it's strong enough to do that. It's light enough. Um, it's all made of carbon, so it's quite good. Um, other people have um, like a seat system that goes around their waist and around their legs. Um, Marcus's one's probably the most advanced, um, although the, the actual seat thing that locks him in is quite rudimental. Um, his, he's got a steering system on his leg, um, so he's got a, a below-the-knee amputation, so he's got a knee, um, his own knee, and he's got a loop that he puts his leg into and he bends his knee and that turns the rudder. Wow. Whereas my rudder is locked, I, it's just straight, so I just lean the boat and pull a bit harder on one side and... Hope, hope that works. And every athlete's allowed an adaptation, a single adaptation. Well, yeah, you could go, you go all out. You yeah. Could really, really, um, you know, you could mould it out of carbon. You could um, get your, your bum and, and your legs scanned, and you could slip into a little pod. Um, yeah. yeah, it's sort of as long as the the boat um, is not altered and it's um, sort of within the regulations of fifty centimeters wide and um, uh, five point two meters long. Um, and minimum minimum weight of 12 kilos, so it can be anything over that. Um, and also um, uh, the, the steering system as well, I believe it can't be altered, I think. Um, but, you know, as Paracanoa debuted in Rio, there's a lot of rules that are changing. Um, so similar with the, the V1, the, uh, the outrigger canoe, that's, that's quite, that's a similar sort of um, regulations, regulations there as well, um, but you know you could you could really go all out with uh, yeah. the uh, adaptions. Curtis, is there a mantra that you use when you race? Something, some regular self talk that's you know if condition yourself to um, coach yourself around. When I'm racing, I guess there's uh, 
a lot of process that needs to be done. Um, there's different parts of your race that you have to focus on and different uh, stroke patterns. And um, generally at the start, you know, there's a lot of pressure and a lot of power being produced out of the gates. And that makes the paddle do weird and wonderful things um, like popping out of the water as you pull on a paddle it wants to shoot out of the water. So, you know, hands down um, and, and reaching out is pretty much the, the two things that I re repeat in my hands mind. Hands down, reaching out. Yeah, so that the top hand sort of has to be down yeah. and um, sort of in front of your face. Um, if it's above your face, it means that the paddle is uh, probably not all the way in the water and that's, you know, I think maybe an inch of paddle out of the water is almost 10 square centimetres of blade that's not in the water wow. pulling on on, uh, on water to make you go forward. So, and then um, reaching out is you know getting the full length of the stroke because if you're shortening up, you're actually going to go slower and your, your stroke rate might go higher, but you'll go slower. So um, like I was saying before about that longer distance style that I like, mm. um, that's generally what happens um, over as the, the distance goes uh, further, so you, you start shortening up, and you just got to keep rem reminding yourself that to, you got to reach out. And so it's quite technical self-talk. I mean, mm. self-talk wise, you woke up Rio morning, you got to yeah. leave, get allow a three-hour buffer because of yeah, unknowns yeah. with traffic. Um, what's you know, what's the first thought going through your mind as you wake up? Your eyes open on, on an Olympic final day. I uh, I guess this is this is it. This is it. Champions yeah. don't sleep in. Yeah. <laughs> You're not yeah, missing that one. Just, World champions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's uh, just a part of the day, I guess. There's um, and I I don't really I wasn't really that nervous um, until I got on the water. Um, you know, you sort of feel you've done it before. You know, you know what's going to happen. Um, my heat at uh, Rio was a, a bit of an average race I wasn't really listening to the start caller um, so for people who don't understand what um, how the start process works for a kayak race is we've got these gates or buckets as we call them um, and they're sort of on a pneumatic system underneath the water and there's this bucket that sits up out of the, just out of the water and you can float your nose into the front of it um, it's got little strings so you don't sort of so you slide back and it's got a light on top of it it's a red light when you're sitting in there and it says um uh, all hold, you know, they get everyone in the line uh, and everyone's got to be in their gate. Uh, all hold, ready, set, and then it'll beep and the, the gate will shoot underwater faster than you're able to, to push on it, but, uh, or, you know, faster than what, what you think it does. Yeah. It shoots underwater and as it shoots underwater, the light on top turns green and that's when you know you can go. So um, during that heat, I had a bit of a, an average race and, um, I wasn't really listening. I wasn't up in the start position, um, and uh, the gate went down and sort of, yeah. So I knew that going into the final, I had things to improve on, and they're the things that I was thinking about in the morning. You know, making sure that I was listening and and taking in what was immediately around me, not not in the wider area, not the end of the racetrack or the crowd, or and that's you know, that's something that's it's, that was amazing part of that that, that the both days that I raced. Um, you know, the crowd was really up and uh, enjoying it and the, the uh, it come, becomes quite process orientated definitely very you know myopic my the next thing the next thing I remember Craig Mottram uh, Australian you know uh, bronze medalist in the world track champs for 5000 metres multiple Olympic uh, representative for Australia and Craig said on the start line for one of his Olympic finals it's maybe one of the, the best depth fields ever assembled yeah. on, a, on a racetrack for 5000 metres and I said what was going through your head and he said I actually stood there and I thought I didn't brush my teeth this morning. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but he, had, you know, he was he was, he'd gone the opposite way where I think he just oh, that right. was his way of dealing with it. He yeah. was very much oh, let's think externally, but it's, it's fascinating. Uh, Curtis, how would you describe being in the zone? You well, that's exactly what I was just talking about. Um, not listening to the right things when you should be is not in the zone, and and really focusing on the, especially in the start line, you you. you you know, putting those steps, those little processes all through your head like every you know, two seconds, bang, 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 yep, 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 yeah. um, over and over again. And then when, when they say, you know, hold your boats, that's when you know it's you're ready to go, you're listening. Um, but in the zone, again, a training can be anything from um, instead of looking at the, the, the parrots that are flying over top or, 
you know, the rubbish that's just floating past <laughs> or a tennis ball that some kid's lost in the lake. and Or the, uh, the, the bull shark that's swimming beside you. Yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> I, yeah. And, um, yeah, and you're just focusing on you know, your stroke pattern and, and trying to get your hands the right height and uh, reaching the right way and getting good rotation. And, um, you know, and, and then so sometimes looking down at your watch because that's in our racing, we're not allowed a, a stopwatch on our boat. Um, but... Um, you know, in, in training, it's great to have like a stroke counter and, and a stopwatch that you can feel, and you know, you can sort of adjust your pattern. If you're going too hard, you know, it'll show on the stroke counter or yeah. or too slow. So you get some, so, some data. Yeah, so you really, you know, you're feeling the boat, you're feeling the water, and um, and that's sort of in the zone as well. Does data play a how big a part does data play for for yourself and your coach Andrea with um, your performance? Yeah, I guess the coaching staff look at that stuff a bit uh, more. Uh, intently than I do um, you know all I, I do is look at a, a stroke counter and a speed and a stopwatch it's all on the screen in front of me on the on the training days but um, on race days and even the time trials they'll, they'll put on what we call a minimax which is this tiny little GPS unit on the back of our boat it's a very very accurate GPS unit it can tell how far we're going to go with each stroke it can tell you know our stroke counter it's got no sensors on it other than within itself you know a um, some gimbals um, and, and obviously a GPS tracker that's, that's highly accurate um, tells our speed, you know, our performance on, on each stroke. So um, it's very good to, to get. And then we, we get the, um, the exercise science, the physiologist prints it out and they, they show us the sort of the graph of our speed and our stroke rates and, and you know, curves and ebbs and flows of our, of our race. So. Um, it's quite interesting to see in our splits especially um, you know we're trying to reduce those splits as much as we can but um, to be able to, to see you know, the problem or to be able to see where we um, could improve it's, it's really good to, yeah. to see that um, the feedback it's the same in the gym as well we have um, I can't remember what the, that tool's called but it's, it's got this little it's like this box that lays on the ground it's got this cable that goes over our barbell and you pull it up towards you and it measures the force yeah yeah and our velocity of our pull and things like that so that's um quite a cool tool we can see how far and how fast and how much we're pulling so it's all, all feedback isn't it mm. if you could use one word to describe curtis mcgrath's racing style what would it be mm, um racing style Wow. Uh, yeah, I don't know. One word. <laughs> yeah. Um. God. Yeah. I really wouldn't know. I'll, I'll see word. if I can con- yeah, conjure. I'll think about that. Conjure one up for yeah, you. Yeah. 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 Um, I. I mean, I. I. From listening to you so far. Uh, deliberate, maybe. De- deliberate. Yeah. I like that. Might be that one. I was, I was going to say methodical, yeah, but deliberate. I like yeah. it. It's your word. I can't yeah. tell you your word. <laughs> Curtis, uh, if you had to, um, you know, sort of break down, <laughs> leaving aside the care that you mentioned on last week's episode about what it takes to look after your prosthetics and mm. that, you know, looking after your legs is not just a matter of you've got the prosthetics once and away you go. What's the worst injury you've had outside of the management on for your, for your limbs yeah. since you've been paddling anything particular shoulders um, I've had a bit of cortisone in my wrists um, I had the the sheath around my I don't know what that yep, the, next, yep, the, yeah just in here um, it, it inflamed up I had a bit of a golf ball in there uh, the start of 2016 yep. um, and it felt like I had sand in my joint when I was moving my yep. wrist um, and the, the sheath of that um, tendon um was was inflamed and it had a, a lot of uh, inflammation around it, so that's why it felt like that. So I did see the doc and get some cortisone in there. I had to get it done twice last year, I believe. Yep. Um, every now and then it, it flares up, but nowhere near as bad. Um, but uh, almost this time last year, um, on January 1st this year, I um, w- was at home doing some gardening and I picked up a hose reel and, and tweaked my back. and. It's the first time I've ever had a back injury, and that that really hurt. I'm, you know, struggling to breathe because just to further up in the, in the thoracic. Well, just spine in, the, or, in the lower the lower lowest, back, yeah. and it just it got me, and uh, just picked up an empty hose reel. It wasn't heavy. Were you anything. surprised? Because he's this yeah. fit, fit, strong bloke, but it's not uncommon, Curtis. I mean, yeah. in my work as a physio, people come in and say, "I was just picking up my toothbrush." Yeah, you know, yeah. I was just 
just so, the wrong you know, way. And, yeah. And bang, it goes. And, um, you know, obviously nothing's open on December, uh, January 1st, <laughs> so I had to wait until the 2nd and got in and, and, and uh, the physio uh, fixed it up. Sorted it out for you. Curtis, what's the hardest, couple more questions in the performance round we throw out of that, the hardest session you've ever done? Um, I remember last year um, leading up to Rio, we we're doing this. Um, step testing I believe it was and a step test is um, 300 meter efforts and they sort of step up in intensity and effort and um, amount uh, I think we start off at 70% and then we go 80% 90% and 100% and then max and it was quite warm um, that day I can't remember what time of year it was but I remember getting finishing that um, that last 300 meter effort um, and just paddling straight over to the bank and sort of getting up. I remember feeling really, really dizzy and full of lactate. And I just wandered up. I think I left my boat on the beach, which is not <laughs> something I do very often. And I wandered up and I just went straight into the, the, the change room and turned on the shower and just stood under the shower because I was that cooked. Um, and then, you know, 300 metres is a really tough distance because it's 100 metres more than our race distance. Yeah. And it just brings out that lactate just ever so more. And, I think we were doing lactate testing as well, and you know, I'm punching out at like 19 and a half. Yeah, really miles. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so I, I generally have a, a quite a high tolerance for lactate, I'm, yeah. I'm, and I don't know why that is. Some of the the, um, the physiologists reckon that it could be because of my lack of um, uh, large muscle tissue uh, to expel that that lactate. I just more concentrated doses. So I did. I have gone over the twenty mark once before. Wow. But I, yeah. So you yes. feeling that in your fingertips? Yeah. Oh, my face. My face gets real tingly. Wow. Um, yeah. And my <laughs> eyes go blurry because they're full of lactate. Curtis, uh, last question: performance around your eyes, lactate. Well, you do have a lot of little ocular muscles that people don't. We just take for granted, yeah. right? Um, tell me, uh, what's the best recovery tip you'd give for listeners? Other than going and stand under a cold chair and just put that down. Yeah. Um, recovery. I love drinking chocolate milk after because, um, you know, it's, it tastes good and there's a, a fair general amount of protein and, and uh, whatnot in there. But um, when we're overseas, getting ready to before um, our World Championships, so ice baths really good. It's um, yeah. Especially when it's so hot. Um, it cools yourself down and ice baths are um, something that a lot of people will turn their nose up at because they're quite uncomfortable but once you get in there and you, you get out it actually feels like you've you know just woken up from a really good nap and yeah. you're feeling fresh and um, you know, it sort of rebounds you quite well and what's your protocol for the ice baths do you have one or for me um, I like to just jump in for 10 minutes straight and just sit there for 10 minutes um, a lot of people because at the AIS system, um, buildings um, they have uh a hot bath and a cold bath right next to each other and a lot of people do contrast therapy um, whereas I just like to sit in there and, and just do 10 minutes 10, 12 minutes you get chatting and you know, before you know it you're probably sitting in there for 15 minutes you need to get out because you're yeah. starting to shiver so these baths are about 12 degrees so they're quite cold yeah. and the hot baths are about 32 so people were jumping out they'll do you know three minutes in there two minutes in there three minutes and, and you always finish start and finish on the cold yep. um and there's a number of different protocols you can use but um you found me, 10 minutes is, 10 minutes straight just, in your temperature regulation i mean any yeah. amputee the surface area to volume ratio obviously shifts and change yep. what have you found has changed for you with temper temperature regulation Okay. Yeah, and that, that's one of the things. I think I said that last week is, is the temperature. Yeah. Um, my thermoregulation, my body is a bit skewed. Um, and what skin I do have is, you know, covered in, on my legs anyway, is covered in carbon and silicon. So it's not the most comfortable time of year in summer. But um, that that's something you just sort of have to manage um, yourself. Um, there's no real way to fix it other than being in an air-conditioned room. Um, but that's not always going to be the case. It, uh, you know, a lot of heat is expelled through um, your feet as well, so that's another um, you know, outlet that I don't have anymore. So, um, And I find myself getting really hot palms uh, most of the time, especially just before bed. Um, you know, make sure I uh, put my hands under a cold tap just to get more comfortable. I don't, I don't know why that is. It's mm. just... Maybe that's yeah, the, uh, yeah. you know, sort of the, the new conduit for some of that. Yeah, it's, I think so. Um, but yeah, and out 
um, on the water. You know, there's I've been given a um, uh, like a cold vest. Um, it's sort of got these ice blocks that you slide into the the vest and you can wear. But um, I find it's quite a bit of um, admin just to get that sort of set out, uh, set up and, and sorted for for the day. So um, if you know, you get out there do your session and shoot back home and, and sit in the ice bath. So at yeah, home. yeah. Mm. Curtis, uh, well done. You're out of the performance round. Mm. Just to put listeners in a typical training week. Uh, for you so you know without the micro and all the sessions but how many times you're on the water how many times you're in the gym how many times you're in therapy treatment yeah so um, we're probably on the water about seven times a week um, you know six days a week we're, we're training so um, we have always have Sunday off which is nice completely um, off everything yep completely yep. off don't do anything just you, go you lay know, in the pool on yeah, your uh, swan <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you really don't want to do do much on that on that Sunday. Um, you know, physical exercise is the last thing you want to do. I know I know a few people that get out there and, and go do something else crazy. Um, you know, go for a swim and things like that. Uh, like you know, doing laps at, at a pool. Um, and then uh, we're in the gym three to four times a week. Um, that can vary on on what what's what's happening and what sort of stage and cycle we're in. Um, I think we're at the end of an endurance cycle, so it's just three week three days a week uh, Monday. Wednesday, Friday, and that's you know mainly based around you know uh, pulling because my sport is a pulling um, exercise. So uh, we do two days of pulling and one day of pushing. Um, so what, what are the exercises, Curtis? You do within the, the pulls and then the pushes? Yeah. So obviously um, with with the pulling, it's a lot of bench pull, a lot of chin ups, um, a lot of seated row, uh, bent over row, um, and uh, some lot. Um, a lot of gyms don't have the bench pull, so it's a sort of a specialised piece of kit. Um, it's very simple, you know. It's just a bench that's a little bit higher, and the bars in between um, the legs of it, and you pull the bar, uh, the bar up towards your chest, lying down. Um, and that's pretty much our core exercise. That's the one where we try and make sure we go up. And um, I don't mind the chin up side of things as well. That's probably another big one because your back is really important in this sport and, and, and full stop it's really important so, so it's one one sort of body part that gets a bit ignored I think in the gym and, and most people so um, you know it's my tip you know, yeah. look after your back especially yeah. and with the push it, it's quite obvious um, the bench press and your dumbbell press and um, doing a sort of a seated rotation which is sort of down on a, on a cable row it's, we've got this sort of loop um, sort of lasso loop um, that loops around one shoulder and goes around our back and onto the machine. You sort of twist and it pulls the weight. Uh, it's trying to get that good connection and, and the rotation with that connection yes. as well. So sounds interesting. And all this has been, uh, you know, your coach and then also your strength and conditioning coach because you do your gym resistance training at the AIS facility here on the Gold Coast. Yeah, I believe that's that. right. Um, we've got a, a very good uh, strength and conditioning team. Um, I've got Jesse Fleming. He's he's a relatively new uh, strength and conditioning coach, but he's he's come straight from university into the ki- elite kayak sort of mm. arena and, he, and, and triathlon as well. So mm. he, he's sort of across it all now he's been in there for three or four years yeah. um and he's he's under the close uh, supervision of uh glenn workman who uh has been in the sport for about 25 30 years so he, he knows what's what's what and um he'll keep you in check and uh i mean it's an institution that place isn't it uh yeah you know it's a busy place it's got some uh, some years and some uh, success to it curtis uh it- in terms of your bucket list, what's on your bucket list? Obviously, you're looking forward and ahead to Tokyo 2020. Uh, we mentioned Invictus Games coming up uh, as well, but what's what's the bucket list look like for you? Inside sport and outside of sport? I think inside sport, you know, I'd like to be uh, on the podium at least twice in Tokyo. Um, that, that's the main goal, I think, leading up to, to the 2020. Um, Invictus Games, I think that'll be um, just trying to like I'm, I won't be an athlete there. I'll, I'll be on the sidelines, sort of supporting and, and promoting as much as I can. Um, the around that, I think leading forward, um, I've got some opportunities with sponsorships and um, some employment post post uh, Tokyo. So we'll see what that looks like. And um, you know, I don't really know. I don't really see that far ahead yet. So um, you know, although it's only what, two and a half years away. Mm. It's, uh, yeah. it's still there's a lot to be done before then and, and I think if I'm trying to focus on what I'm going to be doing after that it'll just be a work overload and I won't, no, I'll yeah. get distracted by things and 
Um, there's a lot of uh, other opportunities. You know, I do some public speaking and do some uh, some TV work with Channel Seven. So that um, that'll hopefully keep me ticking by and um, keeping me doing things outside of sport as well. So I think that's really important. Is um, you know, a lot of athletes sort of come out of their sport um, on their retirement of that that particular sport and haven't really focused on anything. Um, for after and the AIS have got a really good uh, system that's that's come into play I can't remember I don't know the year that it came in but the, the performance uh, performance excellence and that's um, uh, personal excellence sorry um, that is uh, focusing on you know courses and employment post their sport because I think they identified that that was an issue especially with mental health mm. um, you yeah. know a lot of people get so committed and then so focused on their sport which is rightly so but then if it all goes pear-shaped and you you left out out and you know off the team or you didn't make the make the cut um it can be quite um yeah, yeah demoralizing and, and, and you know you've lost your purpose and trying to find that again is, is really difficult yeah i mean we've spoken about that on the, the program before but that transition out of mm. physical performance world to the next stage whether it's you know gone pear-shaped or whether it's just a organic yeah, and that's right. attrition out of the sport. Um, it's still a difficult one for every athlete to yeah, to and, and that you know I've been I've been lucky to be supported by the military and, and helped me transition into that side of things. And um, I believe that the, the AIS and and other um, sponsors and, and supporters will help me transition uh, post sport as well. But that's it's a long way off. I think um, I'm still young enough to, to give it another crack. And yeah, you're going nowhere yet, Curtis <laughs> yeah, McGrath. That's right. Kurt, uh, how's life changed for you after Rio? I mean, uh, you, you, I imagine you would be recognised more or less. Yeah. Mostly wherever you go. Um, I guess so. There's um, a lot of uh, extra um, events and activities that uh, have come up, and invitations to certain things, which has been amazing. And uh, I thought I was busy before Rio, but now I'm incredibly busy with other, um, you know, speaking and, and like I said, with the, the TV and um, and it's been great. Like there's a, a lot of opportunities uh, that have come up, um, you know, uh, heading on to the, the V8s and, and hanging out with the, the who's who there and, um, you know, speaking at the Legacy Lunch this year um, at the casino and, um, you know, there's certain things that have happened for the better and you know and there's some things that you know you just never thought that would have been possible or a part of life um and that's you know that's that's one of the perks of, of getting the gold medal and, and having the story that i have but um you know i've just been so incredibly busy that there's there's hardly been some uh, time just to chill out and you know, we bought a house in august and uh, before this the december i reckon i'd probably spent about three weeks in total in that house I've just been away so much so um, you know it was there's some good things but you know living out of a suitcase you're a bit tired of that how do you like to relax um, what are you recreational yeah just Cause... probably uh, just chilling out by the pool at home or you know watching a movie um, they don't mind going out for a good feed at a restaurant or a cafe it's uh, there's a lot of good places around on the coast so um, yeah there's um Lots of lots of different activities as well, and to be honest, I, I don't mind paddling. It's um, as as like a relaxing thing. Um, you know, sometimes you get the opportunity just to go out for a light paddle and you can do a loop around one of the islands and then come back, and that's uh, that's quite cool. Would you ever do that from home or always from the facility? Oh, I don't have I don't live on the canal, access, so um, yeah, I have to go down to the boat shed and yeah. grab the boat from there. So, Curtis, if you could boil everything you've learnt. Over the years, your military career, yeah. uh, the incident in Afghanistan, your now Paralympic sporting career, uh, now your media <laughs> career. Uh, if you could boil it all down, though, to one piece of advice to help listeners perform at their physical best, what would it be and why? Um, hmm. I guess uh, try and, and focus on what you can control because the... The controllables are always, you know, the things that you have worked on yourself. You know, the things that you've you've um, you know, been told and, and taught how to, to to deal with it. And the uncontrollables, they're, they're out of your control, literally, and they they just don't. You, there's no point in focusing on them. Focus on what you can control rather than what you, you know, what you can't. 
mate, you are an outstanding uh, ambassador for your sport, for the nation, the nation of New Zealand as well. I know they'd still yeah. lay claim to you. Yeah, they do. Um, we, we do as well. And uh, and certainly just, uh, you know, living life to, to the max and making the most of every opportunity and uh, focusing on the controllables, mate. So thanks for your time so generously nice. shared with us. Yeah, thank you, Brett. So there you have it, another episode of the Physical Performance Show. I trust you enjoyed today's episode featuring Curtis McGrath. If you did, please let Curtis and myself know. You'll find us on social media at Brad underscore beer on both Twitter and Instagram and Curtis, C-U-R-T-M-C-G-R-T-H, Kurt McGrath over on Instagram and Twitter. You can also jump over to pogophysio.com.au and there you'll find a copy of the show notes and all links referred to in the episode today and social media handles shared from that page. If today was your first time tuning into the Physical Performance Show, then a mighty welcome. If today was your 95th time, then thank you for your ongoing support. If you have enjoyed today's episode and know someone who would benefit or enjoy today's sharings from Curtis McGrath, then please share the episode with someone. Simply hit it, share from your smartphone, your device, share the link around. That means the world to myself and I know it will also mean a lot to Kurt. Don't forget to hit subscribe if you'd like to get the episodes each week automatically updated into your device. Lastly, if you've been enjoying the Physical Performance Show, then please consider leaving a review on iTunes. It's simple, jump over to iTunes from your laptop or your smartphone and simply click ratings and review and rate away. I enjoy reading the reviews. They very much provide the feedback and the fuel that makes bringing this show each week easier and certainly more rewarding. A big thanks this week to Jen1977NI. Jen rated the podcast five stars and Jen's comments were, I listened to this podcast in the car on my long commute to work. I actually don't want to get out of the car when I get to work. I'm enjoying it so much. Highly recommended. Jen, thank you very much for taking the time to leave the review. I appreciate it. Thanks once again to the show supporter, and that is Normatech Recovery and, of course, Pogo Physio. Podcasts are free to download, but they're certainly not free to produce. So thank you for your support, guys. Finally, if you're into running, you can now pick up your copy of my running and jogging bestseller, You Can Run Pain-Free. It's available on Audible or iBooks. It's also available, of course, in paperback versions from Amazon internationally, or pogophysio.com.au domestically and, of course, on Kindle or digital versions. To say thanks for tuning in to the Physical Performance Show, you can head over to pogophysio.com.au and pick up your copy for 50% off the recommended retail price of $24.95. It's simple. Simply add in from the shopping cart on pogophysio.com.au the promo code POD2018, that's P O D. 2018 and you'll receive 50% off the recommended retail price. Listeners, just a final note before we wrap up today's episode. If you follow Curtis over on Instagram, one day ago at the time of recording this intro and outro to today's episode, Curtis posted a photo of himself surrounded by his Defence Force friends, mates, and also some beautiful young children, I presume, from Timor, where he did the humanitarian work. The caption reads this, After 12 years in the uniform, I have called it a day and made my way into the life of a civilian. Thank you to all the adventurers, friends, and memories. It was a blast. Excuse the pun. I think that sums up Curtis McGrath. What an outstanding character, an outstanding role model for so many people. Certainly, Curtis, uh, I want to congratulate you and thank you for your service to Australia and also the world in terms of your humanitarian work and the inspiration that you have provided and continue to provide in your work across all these wonderful endeavours. Thank you, Kurt McGrath. You're a true gentleman and I'm sure listeners, you can understand why we wanted to devote this long form conversation to cover Kurt's story. On that note, guys, coming up next week, we jump back 
into an expert edition. And next week, we bring you an interview or a conversation had by Emily Georgiopoulos of Pogo Physio, our women's health physiotherapist, speaking with Laurie Fauna, a women's health physiotherapy specialist. Laurie and Emily explore all things women's health as it pertains to physical activity. The girls dive into pre-post-pregnancy exercise routines, topics that often don't get a lot of airtime around women's health, things like incontinence for athletes. There's so much covered in this episode. If you are a female listener, then be sure to tune in next week. And if you're a male listener, if next week's expert edition does not have any interest for you, then please forward it on to a woman in your personal world who may be able to benefit from the information that Emily and Laurie share. So until next week, keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer, and this has been the Physical Performance Show.